All righty. All right, guys, Ethan here. And today on this week's You Ask, We Answered, I've got my buddy Peter, Do Dr. Peter Armstrong, DVM. What's going on? We're in Texas, and in Texas, you have to drink Texas beer. So we're gonna crack us a cold one and get started answering your questions. We have a question from Steve Songer 79 It says, what do you recommend for a good probiotic? So probably my favorite probiotic um, that I use on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis is ProViable. Um, that's a really good option. It's in a capsule. You can sprinkle it on the food or, or put it in some water if they're um, not drinking or not eating the way you want them to on the road. Um, and then Fortiflora would be the, uh, the other option. <laughs> Perfect. We use the ProViable because it comes in that capsule. You hooked us up with those uh, a little while back and I've definitely found that um, when we use probiotics most is on the road, and when you're out in the wind trying to get this little powder to under your dog food, half of it goes on the ground anyway. So capsules work awesome. Great question. Next question we've got from Poodle Pointer underscore June. Daily eye boogers. Normal or an indicator of something else going on? Normally it's a really normal thing. Um, it can definitely be allergy related. Okay. Uh, dust certain times a year, um, kind of just like us. Um, we can see some, some discharge from the eyes. So. Um, if it's not a, a constant problem and it's not, you know, there's not scabs forming underneath that, then probably not super concerned about it. So I feel like I see it in uh, the change in environments at the kennel, or if we do have like a period of really dusty days, stuff like that. Just sure. yeah. general dust related, as long as it's not turning green and getting really nasty, yeah. wipe it. Sure. Perfect. Good question. Thank you. Next, we have Isaiah James. Adrian, I have a one and a half year old poodle pointer that has started stopping 10 feet short and wanting to pull the feathers at the tail end of her first duck season. So sounds like it's coming back with a retrieve, stopping, setting them down, and then picking feathers. Um, really? That is not that uncommon of a thing for dogs to do with ducks. And the answer to that is formal retrieving work. You go through the steps. We have a series on our YouTube channel that you can watch, and we're gonna shoot that to update that series with what we've changed kind of training philosophies over the last five, six years ago when we shot that. Um, but ultimately, formal retrieving work is gonna be the answer. You wanna go through all of the steps to say, learn hold, learn fetch, and then put it together to retrieve ducks again. It sounds like the end of his question, maybe it's at the end of the season here, not necessarily just the duck. So at least for me, uh, since I'm not a trainer, what happens to me is I usually end up hunting pretty sloppy towards the end of the season. So yeah. that's probably something in the off season that you can tidy back up, I would think. I think the way you read that is right. So at the tail end of your season, stuff has gotten sloppier. The answer to the question is formal retrieving work and to stay on top of it during the season or mid-season tune-ups. You know, yeah. get a good trainer that uh, comes and hunts with you every once in a while. <laughs> Next question we've got from Robert. <laughs> <laughs> Robert on Instagram. My poodle pointer uh, pup is seven months old and is just better behaved and calm indoors while sitting. Um, do you teach your pointers to sit? That is the main question here. The answer to that is yes. It's a super common question because it's kind of an older philosophy to say you don't teach your pointers to sit. We don't teach our pointers to sit. And the reason for that all, in my opinion, comes back to the fact that the average person overdoes it and it becomes a default. Anytime you overdo anything in training, whether that be too much woeing or too much sitting or too much recall or too much place training, the dogs end up when they don't know what you're asking of them to move to one of those defaults. Like I did this before and got rewarded for it. So if you're trying to teach the dog to stand and you've put a ton of emphasis on sitting, and they're kind of confused at what you're asking about whoa, then they resort to sitting down and people think that the fact that they know how to sit is the problem. No, the problem is that you're not doing a good enough job of teaching. So yes, we teach all of our dogs to sit. It does not cause any problems as long as you're making sure to, that it doesn't become a default. A good way to tell that is if every time you call your dog to you, they come up and instantly sit down. Or if you think that they're trying to get your attention, 
they just come up and sit down. And if they're sitting everywhere, you probably need to move on from that. Long story short, yes, you can teach your dog to sit. No, it won't cause problems unless it becomes a default. The dog's gotta be livable. <laughs> the dog has to be livable and obedience is part of it. Yeah. Next question from Kyle Winterstein. What are the early symptoms of a seed infection? Can anything be done to stop their prolification? The early signs are going to be the same as early signs of any infection. One is gonna be a fever, two, um, a big infection like sluggishness, a change in personality. Um, even for us, a change in personality would be not eating uh, their meal or eating slower. Anything that you go, you seem off, you don't seem yourself, check their temperature. Yeah, I think fever is gonna be the big thing that you're gonna see in these guys. And I, and I think, um, and, and I definitely just as a practicing veterinarian fall into this where and so I think sometimes you have to be an advocate for your dog as well, because yeah. we get into a routine of a, of a dog that comes in and you know, every once in a while we see a dog that's got some kind of fever for some random thing, it goes away on its own. Um, but a Yorkie living in the house probably is not gonna come into the same contact that these hunting dogs are. Yeah. So I think it's really important to try to just make sure you're an advocate for that and remember that that's a possibility that could happen. Um, Cause I think the big problems that, that I've seen have been when those dogs have gone three, four days without care, yeah, uh, appropriate care, and and all the antibiotics in the world oftentimes are not the appropriate care. And so recognizing that and saying, you know, asking your veterinarian, you know, in a polite way, I'm not trying to second guess you, but you know, we've come in a lot of contact with a lot of different things that normal dogs don't. So and just politely saying that, how do we just go ahead and make sure that we don't have a problem? And unfortunately, you know, a lot of times CT is the, the way to diagnose that. And, and few practices have that you know readily available to use every day so. we've had to go to the university every time yeah and so um, that's something just to keep in mind is just you know make sure that you're at least suggesting that um, you know to your veterinarian because they may not be thinking um, especially if you travel to hunt a bunch and, you know you live in dallas and um, probably yeah. not a big constant for people with a short hair but you know if you've been in kansas the last two weeks hunting they definitely be a problem so, yeah the other thing would be that's pretty basic, uh, a standard CBC and CAM count. For sure. You can get that CBC and see the potential of an elevated white blood cell count. Um, your vet's gonna know how to read that. They're gonna understand, hey, these are signs that something's going on that maybe we should look further. So, uh, great question. The biggest thing is pay attention to your dog. If they seem off, check. Good question. Next, we've got a few here. All right, it says the Challenger, Chal Challenger, Instagram question. Again, apologize for all of the butchering, but you guys created these tags, not me. <laughs> <laughs> My dog is hesitant to retrieve dead birds. Docs, should I move to live birds or is it too soon? Um, I'm gonna say if your dog is hesitant of a dead bird, I would not move to a live bird just yet. I think that that could cause more problems than it's worth. Uh, encourage them, get excited. Sometimes with puppies, you've got to almost act silly where you're getting down on the ground and, woo, look at this puppy. And um, talk like that, it helps. Woo, look at this puppy. Uh, but get excited with them. And um, the other thing that you can do is bring out another dog that wouldn't be, be overly aggressive retriever, but maybe another puppy that they could kind of play together. That would be a good thing if you can find one of those. But definitely not move into live birds until at least comfortable with that uh, dead bird. Or when we do it, we lock the pigeons of the birds so they can't flap around. That's what we're worried about is flapping wings, hitting the puppy, scaring them more. So, good question. This is a good one for you, Peter. It says, blue the hunting wine. Is it beneficial to add things such as veggies, coconut oil, fish oil pills to dog food? So there's a bunch of different things that you can add to dog food to need it. Um, I'm a big fan of feeding a a uh, well-balanced food. Um, I know Ethan at the kennel feeds you can do the, mm -hmm. um, and that's a you know, something along those lines is really good. It's just a, a well-balanced food. You should not have to add anything to it at all. Um, you know, we get into pro talking about probiotics. That's again in stressful situations or, or they're working pretty hard. But a good balanced food um, you can add or subtract food depending on the working conditions. But I, I don't think there's any need to add veggies or, or anything on top of that or, or any other kind of supplements um, outside of probiotics. Perfect, great question. Um, next one, Tony Jenkins, 062019. 062019. That'll get some. Ah. <laughs> in hunting a versatile dog, should I stay away from shooting fur in front of him? 
That all depends on how you want to hunt your dog. I personally don't hunt fur, don't want my dogs chasing rabbits, coons, squirrels, porcupines, whatever is going on, so I don't. But if you don't maybe have as access to as many birds and you're gonna have the option to rabbit hunt, shoot the rabbits. Doesn't matter, it's all up to you on that one. If you don't want them to pay attention to fur, don't shoot the fur. Next question we've got uh, from Kirk Johnston 92 Any tips for shooting or is it just practice makes perfect? Well, I'm gonna say that a few tips there's a lot of practice involved, but poor practice is not going to make you a better shot. So uh, a couple things that I think are misleading is the average person tries to shoot a shotgun like a rifle, which involves pointing. And when you point the rifle or aim your rifle, you're aiming at non-moving targets. And I think that most people follow targets and stop. Well, the target keeps moving, and by the time your reaction happens, you're now shooting behind. So moving with and swinging through would be a big one. The other side of it, and this will take a little bit of time to get used to, um, but check your eye dominance. And if you don't know how to do that, there's a couple different, you can search it real quick online. Um, I could even create a video later so that you've got one you can find on our channel. But basically um, checking which eye dominant you are and because uh, a lot more people than you think would be right-handed and left eye dominant, which means you're looking across the barrel, which is gonna be cattywampus. Um, and there are things that you can do with that, but check your eye dominance and then last. If you can do it and learn to do it, shooting with both eyes open is going to make you a better shot. Having both of your eyes help with depth perception as well as being able to track and not lose targets. So being able to shoot with both eyes open would be another thing there. I do and would try to do. You got any other shooting tips? You got shot the hell out of me with ducks the other day. Uh, I would add, don't shoot next to the guy with the big gun. <laughs> you will be embarrassed. So that would be my only shooting tip. So. <laughs> I don't know about that. Next question, Chad Clemens. I have a one and a half year old GSP. Her second heat will be coming up in March of 2020 here. Breed then or wait until she's greater than two. So I think age-wise, she's appropriate to breed at this point. She's not going through her second heat cycle. I think she would be fine. I think you've always got to look at, you know, what are we breeding for, right? So are we, are we trying to just create puppies here? Have we have a male that we'd really like to breed to? Um, have we done the health testings that are behind that? Um, and so hips are going to be the big thing, right? Because when we're selling puppies, we don't want to have a puppy that we've sold to somebody that six years old is not doing well and has hip dysplasia. Um, so there's two big ways that we look at hips. Um, OFA is going to be one of those and then pin hip is going to be the other. Um, OFA is going to be a process um, that preliminaries can be done, but the finals can't be done until after too. So yeah. if you're going to use OFA for your system, um, it's gonna, you're not going to be able to define that until she's after two. Uh, if we're using pin hip, we can do that as early as 16 weeks. It typically costs more, um, but it's definitely something that you can get a really good subjective measure of what those hips will be. And, I know Ethan does all of his dogs pin hip. Yeah. Um, OFA's fine. Um, I think there's there, there's some variability in those. Maybe don't stay the same as, as they get older uh, on some of those dogs. But pin hip, this is a really good number. Um, and it's, it's just a matter of, of measuring the, how tight the ball sits in there. Put some pressure on that dog to sleep. How much, how much pressure is, or how much distance is there. And gives us kind of a relative gauge for how well uh, short haired or any of them breed will do within that breed of dogs. So you know, that's a good thing to remember is that those dogs are scaled within that breed of dogs. So a German Shepherd's not gonna be, you know, on the same scale as the short hair is. Yeah, and the bigger the dogs typically, the more issues with hips and rot. That makes sense. I mean, the more wear and tear on them, but um, the cool thing about, and to kind of describe it, you're checking two things. You said this with the hips, but the way that I always think about it is the more room that that hip has to roll around in the socket, the more that there's gonna be trauma over time. So they're looking for tight hip, ball in the socket, and yeah. you have less issues. Yeah. So we've got a lot of great questions here. I think we're gonna keep rolling and what may end up happening is somewhere in the middle of that, it gets broken into a, a two-part problem, two-part video. There's no problems here.